Welcome to another Fear No Fix video. Today we're going to be showing you how to diagnose and replace your oxygen sensors. O2 sensors, sometimes called air fuel ratio sensors, are some of the most important equipment in your car. They have two main tasks. First, they measure the amount of oxygen in your exhaust gases. They use this to calculate how much unburned fuel there is. This lets the engine controller make adjustments to how much gas is being injected. Second, they monitor the health of your catalytic converter. They let you know when it's on its way out. Over the years, the design and operation of O2 sensors has changed and evolved. Ultimately, it breaks down into two types. There's an older type and a newer type. We'll show you the difference when we're demonstrating live data further on in this video. Your O2 sensors are installed in your exhaust in two primary locations. The sensor installed before the catalytic converter is referred to as sensor number one. The sensor installed after the catalytic converter is referred to as number two. Depending on the type of vehicle you have, you may also have more than one bank of exhaust. So for example, say you've got a V6, you might hear something like bank one, sensor one. That's the pre-catalytic converter sensor on bank number one. If your O2 sensors are on their way out, you may experience a number of symptoms. You may see something like misfires. You may see poor fuel economy. You might experience poor performance, lack of power. You may also get codes saying that your catalytic converter is on its way out. And you really want to look into these because if you replace your catalytic converter when really it's just an O2 sensor that's bad, it's going to cost you a lot more money. So we're going to get things started by doing a quick visual inspection of the sensors and the wiring. Let's get started. If you're watching this video because you read a code on your vehicle that refers to a lean or a rich condition, then you might want to have a look into that before you start looking at your O2 sensors. We've got videos on these topics you can check out, and it's worth having a look at them just because if you do have a legitimate issue with a lean or a rich condition and you go about replacing your O2 sensors, it's still going to be there after and you've replaced a part for no reason. On this four-cylinder car here, we've got one bank, two sensors. Up on the top, we've got sensor number one. This is the one that provides all of the fuel corrections to the engine controller, let it to know how much more gas to inject. Further down, just after the catalytic converter, we've got sensor number two. This is the one that lets your car know whether your catalytic converter is working properly or not. Let's get started with a visual inspection of our sensors and the wiring. Before we get started, make sure everything's nice and cool. The exhaust gets very hot and you don't want to burn your hands while you're doing your inspection. Starting with sensor number one, we're basically just going to do a quick look at the wiring, pull us back, we're going to make sure there's nothing frayed. We're gonna look for any obvious signs of damage, like something that's been melted, you know, wiring can lean up against the exhaust and it could melt and that'll obviously damage it. We're also gonna check out our connectors. We're gonna make sure they're in nice and tight. We'll also disconnect them. Have a look inside. We'll also look in there. We'll just have a look at the pins, make sure there's no obvious corrosion. Maybe a pin's bent, there's some other physical damage. So we can see this sensor here is in pretty good shape. We've got another sensor further down just after the catalytic converter. We're gonna do the same thing for that one. Once again, just make sure everything's cool before you start reaching around because it's really easy to burn yourself on hot exhaust. So that all looks good. We've got a couple examples here that will show you of what a bad sensor looks like. So this one here, pretty obvious. You can see that it was rubbing up against the exhaust at some point and melted all the way through the shield. It also melted all the way through the wiring and all these wires are just shorted together completely. So this isn't going to work. This one here is a little more subtle. If you look inside the connector, you'll be able to see that there's some corrosion built up on the pins. If there's any corrosion built up on the surface of the pins at all, this is going to affect the resistance, which in turn is going to affect the signal being read by the vehicle, which could cause these O2 sensor codes. So we finished our brief visual inspection. Our wiring looked good, our sensors looked good. We didn't see anything obvious. So now we're gonna move on to talking about the O2 sensor heater circuit. Your vehicle's fuel system can run in either open or closed loop. Open loop means that it's using a pre-programmed amount of fuel and it's basically just using default values that were programmed in the factory. Closed loop on the other hand means that it's using feedback from your O2 sensors to make decisions about how much fuel to inject. Your vehicle will run an open loop when you first start it up while it's heating up. O2 sensors usually have a certain operating range they need to be in for temperature. Once you hit the operating temperature, your vehicle should go closed loop unless something's wrong. If the vehicle detects a problem with the O2 sensors, it's gonna fall back to open loop mode, but in general, you should always be enclosed as this is when the vehicle runs most efficiently. Most vehicles have a heater circuit on the O2 sensors. These heater circuits help your O2 sensors heat up quicker and get into that operating range after you start the car so you're not reliant on the exhaust temperature to heat up the sensors. 
Additionally, some newer designs of O2 sensors require a temperature so high to operate properly that the exhaust will never get it to that point. If you're having an issue with the heater circuit in your O2 sensor, it may take an abnormally long time to get into closed loop mode, or if you've got newer sensors, you might never get up to that temperature and you'll never go closed loop at all. An easy way to check the operation of your O2 sensor heater circuit is to have a look at the resistance on the heating element. Typically, you'll find your O2 heater circuit on two wires that are the same color. For example, on this car here, you've got two wires that are black, but they may not both be the same color on your car. If you aren't sure which wires are for the O2 sensor heater circuit, maybe look online, see if you can find a spec sheet for your sensor. If you can't find one, then you can probably just skip on to the next step. So we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna unplug this connector. And then what we're gonna to wanna to do is measure the resistance on the two wires that are the same color. So that's in this case, it's gonna be these two bottom pins right here. Now, you're probably not gonna be able to get the probes of multimeter in there. And you don't wanna push. If you push in, you might damage something. And when you plug it back in, it might not make good contact. So in our case, we're gonna use this back probe kit. We're just gonna put those in there. If you don't have something like this, you can use just a regular multimeter, maybe some alligator clips, and then some paper clips attached to those and just put them in there gently. If you do use paper clips, make sure that you don't get the plastic coated kind because you're not gonna get any signal then. All right, we've got our multimeter in resistance mode. We've got the connector. We know which wires we're gonna look at. They're the two on the bottom. We've got our back probe kit attached or paper clips. And what we're gonna be looking for is a resistance range in about the one to 20 ohm range. If it's slightly outside that range, it may not be a problem. Um, try to find a spec sheet for your sensor that might tell you what it should be. And if you see no resistance at all, then that probably tells you that there's a short somewhere. If you see infinite resistance open, then that means that there's a break somewhere and either way, your heater's probably not gonna work properly. So we're just gonna gently insert our probes. We don't want to damage anything. And getting about 2.9 ohms, 2.8, 2.9. So that tells us that the heater circuit on this vehicle is in good condition. It's not open, it's not shorted. So now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start looking at our O2 sensor data. If your visual inspection and multimeter tests came back okay, we can use live data to further diagnose your oxygen sensors. The two types of oxygen sensors report different values. The older style will report in volts only, but the newer style will report volts, lambda, or current. You'll know the difference based on which data your vehicle is reporting. To get started, we'll use our app to look at the live data coming from this older style sensor. To get started, you'll need to plug in your sensor, start your vehicle, and get it up to operating temperature. While we wait for the vehicle to get to operating temperature, let's set up the app. To get set up, we're gonna to go to our live data tab and select the data points that we need. We need our engine coolant, RPM, absolute throttle position, and whatever data points are showing for the oxygen sensors. We can see we have bank one sensor one and bank one sensor two. Then we'll go back and we'll start reading the data. Our engine is up to operating temperature at 210, and we can see that the voltages are being reported from our oxygen sensors. Taking a look at our sensor data, we're using older style sensors. So their range is between zero and one volt. What we're looking for with sensor one is we're looking for it to fluctuate between 0.1 and 0.9 volts. If it's moving up and down like this in a regular pattern, that's what we're looking for. With sensor two, or the post-cat sensor, we're looking for that to average around 0.4 volts in a properly running engine. This is good data, so we're gonna come back and we're gonna show you some bad data. Here we're seeing bad data from our sensor one, or pre-cat sensor. Before we saw that the sensor would jump wildly between small and high values, but here we can see that it's just staying in the middle and it's only showing smaller values. Here's another example of bad data coming from the pre-cat or sensor one. You can see that the data goes wildly from zero to one or in the middle and it's not consistent in any way. If you have this case or the case that we showed just now, you likely need to replace that sensor. Here we can see some bad data for sensor two or our post cat sensor. You can see that before the line was nice and flat, but now the line is ranging between high and low values over and over again. 
If your sensor was stuck at zero volts, or stuck at one volt, or moving back and forth between the two extremes like this one, you'd suspect that either the sensor was bad, or that you had a wiring issue of some kind. And it's worth pointing out that you could see this kind of behavior with sensor 1 as well. Okay, this is a bit of a special case. We can see here that sensor 1 is showing us what seems to be good data, but sensor 2 is following the data from sensor 1. In this case, there's a couple of scenarios. Either there could be some kind of wiring issue, sensor 2 could be bad, or it's possible that your catalytic converter has gone bad and sensor 2 is reading correct data. If that's the case, we have a video on helping you diagnose your catalytic converter. While your sensor data might look good under normal conditions, they may not be reacting correctly under other conditions. To test that, we can introduce a lean or rich condition. Chris is going to show you how. Alright, so we've got two options. The first one is to introduce a lean condition. To do that, you just unplug a vacuum hose. Your other option is to introduce a rich condition by taking a combustible gas like propane or whatever and spraying it around the intake or a hose. Number one is easier and it's safer. If you're going to go with number two and you want to introduce a rich condition, take a lot of precautions, wear safety glasses, have a fire extinguisher, have a friend around, someone just to keep an eye out in case something explodes or catches fire, but just be very careful. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to unplug this vacuum line here, and then we're going to see what Jordan sees in the live data. All right, it's off. Okay, there we go. We can see that the data has changed as soon as Chris pulled the hose. What we're looking for is for that data to go low and read a low voltage. In our case, it's not doing that, so this sensor might be bad. While we're showing this test on sensor 1, or the pre-cat sensor, this test could also be applied to sensor 2, or the post-cat sensor. Now that we've shown you how to read data from the older style sensor, let's move ahead and show you how to read data from the newer style sensor. To set up our app, we'll need to pull in our data points. We need to pull in engine RPM, absolute throttle position, and you'll see that the new style sensor is called a wide range sensor. Let's pull in current and the equivalence ratio. We're going to focus on the upstream or pre-cat sensor 1 data since the sensor 2 data for new and old sensors looks the same. Here we can see some normal data for a more modern sensor. Modern sensors read in lambda or in milliamps of current. The ideal ratio for a lambda sensor is 1.000. That would be perfect. And for current, you would see 0, 0.000. That's not realistic for real world scenarios, but you can see that these are moving around a little bit and they're not jumping around by wide ranges. If the lines on your graph look perfectly flat, you may need to go in and change the scale of the graph so that you can get more detail. We're now gonna show you some bad data. For simplicity, we've gotten rid of the lambda reading and we're just gonna focus on current but the behavior is the same. You can see here that this current reading is 0, 0.000, and if we had the lambda sensor up, it would show 1.000. These values are perfect, and that's almost impossible to achieve in the real world. We suspect that there could be a problem. Okay, here's a different example of bad data. You can see that our data is spiking really high, really low, and it's just kind of all over the place despite our RPM being at idle. This looks like a bad sensor. Similar to the older style sensor, your sensor may be acting normally under normal conditions, but may be not responding correctly in other conditions. To test that, we can do another lean or rich test and see how it responds. When Chris unplugs the hose, you can see that there's a spike up in our data. That would indicate that the sensor is responding normally, and the spike down is when he plugs the hose back in. If when you pull the hose, the sensor doesn't respond and you don't see any change in data, then you likely have a bad sensor or some kind of wiring issue. If by looking at your sensor data, you determine that one or more of your sensors is bad, Chris is gonna show you how to replace it. Pretty much all O2 sensor replacements are done the same way. The only thing that's really going to change car per car is where the sensor is located and how easy it is to get out. On this Civic, our O2 sensors are very accessible, so we're cheating a little bit here, but in this car it's just sitting right on top out in the open. Before you start, you're going to want to let the car cool off for a little while, and then you're going to want to take your penetrating fluid of choice, 
spray it down, give it a good soaking, let that really creep in there and just kind of help you break the threads loose. Sometimes these can be pretty seized in place. You can buy a special kind of socket for removing O2 sensors. It has a little slot in the side and this is what the wire goes through on the sensor since there's a little pigtail that comes out. If your sensor is really seized in place, you may find that as you're cranking on it trying to get that sensor out, this opens up a little bit and maybe it won't hold the sensor as well. So if you're removing a sensor that you don't plan on ever putting back in, another option is to just cut the wire off at the top of the sensor and then you can just put a traditional socket over the top. So we'll just slide the sensor wire into the socket, install it on the sensor. Don't forget to disconnect your plug. And then just push firmly. The sensor is proving pretty easy to remove. It may not always go this smoothly. All right, so we've got our sensor out. It actually looks pretty good. I think this is fairly new. That's probably why it was so easy to get out. But we do have some other examples of bad sensors here to show you. So this one here has got some deposits on it, some possible contamination that could explain some performance issues. This one here has some physical damage on it. I can't even imagine how this happened, but it's not hard to tell why this one isn't working properly. If you pull your O2 sensors and you see a white chalky substance on them, that may mean there's some silicone contamination. Well, if there's a white gritty or sandy substance, maybe it's got a blue or green tinge to it, then that may mean you're burning some coolant. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna install this O2 sensor in the vehicle. So before installing the sensor, we're gonna put a little bit of high temperature anti-seize on the threads. This is an investment for the future. Either the next owner of your car or future you will be very happy that you did. We're gonna put it on sparingly and we're gonna be very, very careful not to get it on the actual element of the sensor as we could contaminate it and it will affect the readings. Once it's nice and snug, you're gonna to wanna to grab a torque wrench and you're gonna to torque it to the manufacturer suggested torque specification for your vehicle. You'll be able to find this in a factory manual. You should be able to find it online. Uh, maybe if you look around automotive forums, you'll be able to find a suggested torque for your vehicle. And now we'll plug it back in. And we're good to go. Hopefully this video helped you figure out what's going on with your O2 sensors and replace the affected part. If this video helped you, give us a like, subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to hit the bell icon so you can be notified of future videos. And until next time, fear no fix.